Welcome to WordPath, the show about Oklahoma Indian languages and the people who are teaching and preserving them. Tonight our topic is new language, that is language that is invented for new concepts or new objects that people encounter for which they didn't have words or expressions before. Um, this is important because a lot of people who are either students or teachers or speakers of Oklahoma Indian languages have expressed some frustration to me about this problem. They say, well, our language doesn't have a word for telephone or computer or VCR. What are we going to do? We, we can't just invent one. What, you know, we, people are reluctant to take that authority to invent new language. Uh, and yet, of course, if people have things they want to talk about and they can't talk about it in the traditional language, then they're going to have to revert to English. And then you kind of lose an opportunity to use the traditional language. And we don't want to lose any of those opportunities. I suggest to people that you should get together a committee of of elders, of, of whatever fluent speakers you have that can be seen as having some authority and sort of form a committee and invent words for these things if necessary. It sounds outrageous to people sometimes at first, but tonight I want to give a little perspective on this whole idea about inventing new words for things because every language does it. Every language has to do it. And I think if we get this perspective, people may be less afraid to invent new words for things in Oklahoma Indian languages. Now, let's get to get an overall view of um, the kind of invention that does go on in language. Let's look at our first chart here. There are several things you can do if you need a word for something. Let's say someone has discovered a new species, or you've encountered a new people, or um, science has discovered something new or has a new concept that it needs a name for. Uh, perhaps there's a new craft that you uh, found in your travels and you want to kind of give it an English description or name new foods, new discoveries, all sorts of things may give you cause to come up with new language. Now, one way that this can be done, number one, is to borrow a word that already exists in another language that does have a word for the thing. And an example of this would be ballet, which was a perfectly good French word for a type of dance, and it was borrowed into English because English-speaking people became familiar with ballet and had no word for it, so they said, well, here's a perfectly good word in the other language. We'll adapt the pronunciation a little bit to make it sound more English, and now we have a name for this thing. And so that was the history of the word ballet. The history of the word skunk was similar. Uh, Europeans who came to this country found these animals that they were quite unfamiliar with, that the Algonquian-speaking uh, natives of the area were calling something that sounded to them like skunk. I'm sure it didn't sound exactly like that. I think it was a little tougher to say. Uh, something that didn't sound very English, so it was simplified and it sort of anglicized so that it sounded like an English word and the word skunk was sort of invented, but really it was borrowed from the native language. And there are lots of other examples of this. Epe as a type of fencing sword is an example of another borrowing from French, a borrowing from Russian that is kind of out of use now but was popular when it first came into the language is Sputnik. Uh, the Russians called their first uh, uh, space venture vehicle, a Sputnik, I think they pronounced it. So we made it sound a little more English because we don't have shp in English, so we called it Sputnik. Uh, a yo-yo is a popular toy that, was, I understand that word was borrowed from one of the Philippine languages, of which there are many. They must have had something like yo-yos that uh, Americans picked up in their travels in the Philippines, I suppose. And so we just borrowed that word into our language. Why, why invent a new thing out of whole cloth if there's a perfectly good word that sounds, sounds like it would be a plausible word of English? Let's just borrow it. It's funny that we call this borrowing, but we never give the words back, so we really just kind of adopt them or take them. Swipe them, you might say. A second method is to take an old word that does exist in your language and extend it in some way. For instance, shot. Now we have, um, you can shoot someone with an arrow or a gun. Uh, you can take a shot to the head. There's something that's kind of an impact type of action. It's called a shot. But when injections, medical injections first came into use, I don't know who decided that they should be called shots, but now we think of shot as just being a multi-meaning word. It could mean you get shot with a bow or an arrow or a, or a gun or a cannon, or it could mean you take a shot to the head, or it could mean you get a shot in the arm to uh, vaccinate yourself against the flu. All of these things are now called shot. But at one time that word shot was extended to cover the new concept of injections, which didn't exist before, so we had no word for it. Another example is ship. In fact, there's a whole series of these words taken from marine usage and naval usage uh, to describe uh, vehicles and personnel in space travel. So Captain Picard is captain of his ship. He has a first mate. They dock at the space station. Many of these words are words that already existed in our language. They had never been used for space travel because space travel didn't exist, not even in the imagination at one time. Um, and, and yet, so many of the concepts were parallel to the sort of things that go on in a, 
in this other kind of vehicle that travels throughout a space. So these terms were sort of extended so that they not only refer to things that go on in uh, marine ships, but now also in space ships. Um, so that's another example of uh, extension. How about a fax machine? There, there was the word before in English, which was originally a borrowing, actually, facsimile, which means a similar kind of copy. And facsimile copy was used to describe other things before fax machines came into usage. So there's a little adjustment that went on there in our English language usage. And we shortened that facsimile to just fax, which is the way we usually refer to those machines now. Um, and it was just sort of decided by common consensus that a fax was this particular type of appliance that sends printed uh, matter um, electronically in a certain kind of way. In other words, what we know as a fax machine or a fax copy. So this word facsimile was kind of shortened and it's meaning specialized to a new thing that didn't exist before. So of course we didn't have a name for it. We had to come up with something and we used this strategy in this case. A third kind of strategy is blends. Blends is where you take two already existing words and kind of mush them together, usually kind of contracting them so that you lose some of each. A famous example is smog, which is a combination of smoke plus fog. And what we call smog is very much like a combination of smoke plus fog. So we actually combine the words uh, since the concepts seem to be combined in this, in this new no notion, which is really just a 20th century concept of smog. It didn't exist before, so we didn't have a word for it. So we invented it uh, by blending two already existing words. Another example is motel. It's a combination of motor and hotel. They're kind of smushed together. The concept of a motel is a hotel-like thing that you motor to. You don't take trains and planes and stuff. You drive up to it. So the, uh, the term motel was invented when uh, probably, I don't know exactly what the date was. I'm guessing maybe the 40s or so, when people started driving around the country and, and staying in these places right on the highway that weren't exactly hotels, and yet they were lodging you drove up to them, they came to be known as motels, and it caught on. A fourth strategy, and this of course only works for languages which uh, have a commonly accepted writing system and where people are literate, you can use initials and acronyms. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this is SNAFU. That's an, an acronym, that is each letter in the word stands for some other word, and there's a kind of a dirty and a clean version of this. I'll, I'll give the clean one. It stands for situation normal, all fouled up. And so a snafu is a situation where things, as usual, are in a mess. And I think this originated in the military, but that's what's called an acronym. You take the initials of several words in a phrase, string them together in such a way that they make a pronounceable word, and there you've invented a new word. This isn't the commonest thing. It's used quite a bit, though, with uh, high-tech equipment and sometimes com in the commercial world. Sometimes we use initials without making them a pronounceable word. We just say out the initials in order, as, for instance, when we say, VCR for video cassette recorder. Almost no one calls that anything but VCR. It's almost as if it were a word spelled out, you know, V-E-E-S <laughs> and so on. Uh, but those actually are initials. That's how we came up with that name. Another common one, this is a, um, an acronym because it is pronounced as if it were a word, BIOS. If those of you who are computer enthusiasts know that that's a built-in operating system. It didn't exist until a decade or two ago and we had to come up with a name for it, and people who knew about such things said, well, this is what it is. It's built in operating system. Rather than just invent something totally unrelated to what we know about, it, let's just take the first letter of each word and make an acronym, and that now is a new word. NASA and UNESCO are two other examples of acronyms. They're often used in proper names of organizations and so forth. Another method, number five here, is to coin an entirely new word, and this is actually fairly rare. Languages don't do this as much as they do the other things. An example of this, you, you see this sometimes in poetry, um, the Jabberwock, of course, um, is, a, is a term invented completely out of whole cloth by Lewis Carroll because he thought it sounded like it could be a word of English and it wasn't, but so what? He was just going to use it as if it were a word of English. And so he, he invented a new word personally himself. Not a real common process, but it is an option for languages. Um, and finally, this is the one that I really want to focus on the most tonight, number six. Another strategy when you need a new word for something is you can use the morphology, that is the word structure principles that already exist in your language, to form new words um, usually by two processes. Affixing, that is you put on a prefix or a suffix that, or, um, that, to a root that already exists, but you make a new combination that didn't exist before. And the other proce morphological process is compounding. For instance, when you take two nouns and put them together, here's a good example from English, sidewalk. Um, 
paved streets with sidewalks, I think, are relatively new. And when they came, I don't know exactly what date they came into being, but there was a time such that before that, people weren't familiar with sidewalks. Sidewalks got invented. They needed a name for them. So it's the walk. I think the word walk probably existed as a noun already. Uh, you know, um, a path that you can walk along is a walk, especially if it has some kind of pavement or stones on it. And it's a sidewalk because it's on the side of a road. That really is the nature of a sidewalk. So side is a word that we already had. Walk is a word that we already had. We put them together because the concepts seem to be a combination of those two concepts. And we came up with what we now think of as a single word. Sidewalk is one word, not two. And it has a plural, sidewalks, and so forth. Um, so that was a new word, but it was made up out of already existing uh, words in the language by this morphological process called compounding. We made a compound noun. Another example, this is, uh, well, this is like affixing, although in this case we don't actually have a suffix or a prefix. In English, there's a morphological process where we sometimes use a noun as a verb. Um, and it became fashionable at one point in restaurants to do what's, called what's now called planking a steak. That is, you cook it, uh, I think it's broiled, under the broiler, but cooked on a wooden plank that has a little raised notches on it so the juices uh, come out in the bottom. Anyway, that piece of wood could be called a plank. But I don't think plank had been used as a verb before until restaurateurs started to decide they wanted to say, well, we do our steaks a special way, we plank them. And so now uh, a lot of us know what planking a steak is, but at one time there was no such concept as far as I know. We had to invent new language to go with the new concept if we wanted to be able to talk about it. So these are some of the general strategies, and I'm going to talk mostly about this number six here this evening and give you examples from some different languages and try to make the point that uh, really um, every language has the resources, the morphological resources to do this kind of thing. Every language can also borrow, extend old words, blend existing words. If it's a written language, you can do acronyms. You can coin entirely new words, but that kind of takes the most energy and it's really the rarest option. What's really most productive and most common and every language has access to equally is you take existing morphology, words and parts of words, and you put them together according to principles of grammar that already exist in your language to form new concepts that will be understood without even having to be taught to people. And they'll say, oh, I see what you mean. That must be a walk along the side of the road. I and, and it catches on, and it becomes popular in a hurry. So this is a very successful method sometimes. Now, let's look at some specific examples, first from English, and then from some Oklahoma Indian languages. Now, I often hear people t tell me something like, in Indian, we don't have words for some of these modern things, so we just describe them. Now, my point here on this next poster is to show that in English, the words that we have that we think of as very uh, high-tech, modern words of our extensive, extensive English vocabulary, in fact, were invented as descriptions of things. We didn't have a word for it, so we made up a word using our morphology of English, but a word that kind of described what the thing was. A lot of these words, we don't think of how they're made up anymore. If you stop and think about them, though, they're kind of quaint expressions. Uh, the first example I have up here is refrigerator. Re means again. Fridge means um, cold, uh, frigid. Words like that are related. And this ater ending means something that does it. So a refrigerator is something that makes things cold again. It sounds kind of unwieldy when you give that full translation of it, but that's what refrigerator really means. And in fact, we have an older term for refrigerators, but before electric refrigerators, I guess, is when this came in. Some people still use it, and that's ice box. A box with ice in it keeps things cold, too. So we had this method that was developed for keeping things cold and decided to call it an ice box. The word ice already exists, box already exists, and so we put it together in a way that works in English and invented a new term, which was later re mostly replaced, I think, by refrigerator. Computer is another one. Lots of people complain that their Indian languages don't have a word for computer. In English, we had no word for computer either when they were invented, so we had to come up with something. Computer literally means something that does calculations. And a lot of languages invented similar words for uh, computer. In some languages, it means something like something that thinks, or the thing that adds up, or the thing that calculates. It's usually something along those lines. Video camera, before they existed, of course, we had no name for them. You don't need a name for something you've never heard of. Uh, when it came in, we had, of course, still cameras. So the word camera existed, which I think has its own interesting history. Uh, it literally means room in Latin, but without getting into that, the video part, video is, uh, video is Latin for I see. 
And so this was a case where we resulted, resorted to uh, borrowing. We borrowed a word from Latin, which we often do, especially with high-tech or scientific things in English. We have a long tradition of doing that. So we took a Latin word for seeing and uh, put it together with camera. Um, another example is automobile. If you think about how that breaks down, auto means itself or by itself. Um, Mobile or mobile means gets around, is, is movable, uh, is in motion. So an automobile is something that gets around by itself. Now, if somebody used that translation in an Indian language for car, people would think, oh, isn't that quaint? The language can't handle a new concept. It has to describe things in this kind of quirky way. Well, English did that too. It's just that once you get used to the word, it doesn't seem quirky anymore. It doesn't even seem as descriptive. It just sounds like that's the name for the thing because it's entered the language, it's been accepted, and it becomes conventional. Telephone, we resorted to borrowing here of, of two little pieces of a word. Tele means distant or, or across distance or something like that in Greek, and phone means sound, and we put those two words together. So when you have sound across distance, that's what you can achieve with a telephone, and that word caught on. Actually, in German, Fernsprecher means about the same thing, distant talker is the, their name for telephone. Uh, dishwasher is something that washes dishes. We didn't have dishwashers before, but we have other kind of compounds of this general structure. We knew what a dish was, we knew what to wash is. ER means something or someone that does it. So we invented something out of existing pieces of English in an English-like way, but the resulting word did not exist before. It really could be described as an, as an invention. Garbage disposal, I think is short for garbage disposal unit. Some people call these garbage disposers with the ER on the end. Uh, but anyway, garbage was a good word of English. Dispose is a good word of English. The er or the ul ending exists in other expressions. So we just took the existing resources of English and put them together in a way that seemed to show the way the concepts in this new object um, went together in the meaning of what it was. And it's very easy to understand what a garbage disposer is. Even if you've never seen one before, you can imagine what kind of gizmo it must be. And then when you're familiar with it, the name catches on because it's very logical. Coffee grinder is something that grinds coffee. There was at one time, I guess, among English speakers when there was no coffee. And so we didn't have any use for coffee grinders. But when they came in, it was pretty easy. To, having a word for coffee at this point and knowing what grinding is and having this ER ending, it was easy to produce this new expression that didn't exist before. And it caught on because it makes sense. Every language can do this. Let's look at the next page. Now here we have some examples for Comanche. Comanche invented words for new concepts. Uh, Comanche has a lot more words for modern um, technical kind of things than I would have thought until a student did a project on this once in a class of ours. Um, they have a word for washing machine, which is tukotse. Now, te means something, as in an object something. Kotse means to wash. So a washing machine is something that washes something. It's a very general sounding kind of thing, but that's the word that caught on for washing machine. And it's taking existing elements of Comanche, putting them together in a very Comanche-like way, consistent with their morphology or their grammar. And so it caught on. A dishwasher is an Awo ma kotse, it has that same kotse meaning to wash. Ma is an element meaning hand, which is a little illogical here, but uh, awo means dishes, can mean dishes. Uh, I think the, the reason the hand got in there, and we don't use our hands much in a dishwasher, but the normal way of washing dishes was to do it by hand. Um, so some of that old concept made it into this new uh, formulation. A radio in Comanche is a kuitsuai tekwap, which means electrical talking electricity and talk. To call someone on the phone in Comanche, you might think, well, that's what's new about that. Well, phones were new. It used to be that you could call people, you know, call out to them with your voice. Same thing happened in English. And then there were phones, and what, what were you going to call it when you initiated a communication on the telephone? Both English and Comanche decided to, to use their already existing word that meant just to call out to someone and use that. Uh, you can say call on the phone if you want to clarify it, but usually it's clear from the context which one you mean. So this is an extension of an old meaning of an old word. Monday. Comanche didn't have names for days of the week. So uh, Sunday is Puaraveni, or medicine uh, day. And then the days after that go with numbers. Uh, one sleep, Samahavita, is literally one sleeping past Sunday, in other words. Tuesday is two sleepings, Wednesday is three sleepings, and so forth. 
elephant. There were no elephants in Comanche land or in their concept or experience. Uh, same applies to English. I don't know actually where our word elephant came from, but in Comanche they came up with a kind of descriptive expression. Essi and it means uh, a gray beast or gray critter or something like that. Telephone, puiwi tequap. It's got the same tequap for talking as the radio did. Puiwi means metal or wire. I think it's referring to the wire that connects telephones. So it's kind of a wire, uh, wire talking. Movies are nanuraqua, which means some shimmering, something that's shimmery or shimmering. Refrigerator, taka awo. That reminds me of icebox in English because it's literally ice. And this means dish or container, awo, as in the word for dishwasher. Um, and finally, beans. Uh, that beans were a new concept to Comanches at one point. I think this was probably centuries ago. They came up with this word, pihura, which is a little unusual in its pronunciation, a little different from some Comanche words. It turns out it was borrowed from a language where it started with F. The, the pronunciation had to be adapted some because Comanche has no F. It used to start with an F, in fact an FR, and that cluster of consonants does not exist in Comanche. The E sound was the same. The H was similar, it was H actually. The U was actually more O, and the R was an L, and the word was frijoles. So this is a borrowing from Spanish. It doesn't look too close to frijoles, but in fact it is. It had to be adapted so that it would sound more Comanche-like in order to catch on as a Comanche word. Let's look at another page just to take a couple of quick examples from other Oklahoma languages. In Ponca, the word for pear sounds just like the word for bear. It's manchu. Uh, how can this be? Well, I'm told that the first pears that most Ponca speakers were aware of came in a can with a picture of a bear on the label. And there was a similarity between pear and bear, which I think may have, the sound of the words in English, which I think may have played a role. But basically they were calling these the bear food or something like that, which actually is the same uh, kind of strategy that was used in Comanche to come up with the word for pears. Coffee is mancan sabe in Ponca, and that literally means medicine black, so black medicine, which I think is a terrific name for coffee. Uh, a mule is a nita tonga, which means big ears. A cow is a te ska, which literally means, this part means buffalo, te, and ska means white. So presumably the first cows seen seemed to be very similar to buffaloes, but so much lighter in color that they were called white buffalo. Let me just give you a few examples from Caddo as we wind this up. In Caddo, the word for church is iniku. Now, there weren't Christian churches at one point in Caddo history, and at one point there were, so they had to come up with a name for them. This word already existed, and this is a case of extending the meaning of an already existing word. Iniku means hill or mound, and it was used to describe the religious mounds in the old Caddo and pre-Caddo cultures. And so this same concept was extended to the uh, European-style churches. Coffee in Caddo, uh, in Ponca, you have a kind of descriptive phrase, but in Caddo, there's a borrowing, capi. You can hear a similarity between café in Spanish uh, or café in French. I think it probably was borrowed from French, but I'm not sure of the exact history, but it's clearly a borrowing. And orange soda in, soda in Caddo is hakeku kaikana, which literally means orange liquid that fizzes. Kind of a long descriptive uh, phrase, but it has caught on as the word for orange soda, which is a greatly beloved drink <laughs> among certain Caddo friends of mine. So, having seen these examples, let me just kind of summarize um, the moral of the story. By the way, the, another famous example of, a, of an occasion when Indian languages had to invent new words for things was the code talkers in World War II. There were Navajo code talkers in the Pacific, of course, but there were also a number of Oklahoma tribes involved in the European theater of operations. The Comanches, for one, there's one surviving member of that unit today. The Choctaws, the Creeks, and I believe some other tribes. Those three I'm, I'm aware of for sure. Now, they had a task of communicating in their language about things that were not a part of their experience tanks, artillery, airplanes, uh, machine guns, grenades, and they had to come up with words for these things. I have a little knowledge of the Comanche uh, strategies that were used. Let me just give you one example, which I love, machine gun. There was a good word, a Comanche word for gun, tawoy, which had existed for some time. Uh, and I'm told that they thought about the sound of a machine gun. It kind of goes that repetitive which reminded one of the members of the unit of a sewing machine, his mother's old treadle sewing machine, which kind of goes tick, 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 
as the needle goes up and down. So they decided to call the machine gun tzitzak an ataroi, or sewing machine gun, based on the sound of the thing. It's a kind of descriptive image. So the moral of the story is every language has the resources necessary to invent new names for new concepts. No language is so deficient or uh, unable to deal with modern life that it can't come up with new words for things that didn't already exist in the language before. In fact, every language, including English and German and all the languages you think of as high-tech languages, have done exactly the same thing. New things have been discovered or invented or thought of and new names, expressions, had to be invented to go with them so that people could talk about them conveniently. Every language does it, every language can do it, using those various strategies we outlined at the beginning. Uh, I think the problem today is with so many Oklahoma Indian languages being severely threatened, having only a few fluent speakers left, people have a certain kind of exalted reverence for the speakers that are still around and they, and they want People, younger people, for instance, who might be in a position to invent new names for things, don't want to kind of take on that responsibility of inventing new words. They feel perhaps they don't have the authority to do so. But I would suggest if you want your language to keep learning, to keep living, um, and people to be able to keep learning it and have a use for it, then you have to be able to talk about modern concepts and objects and inventions and so forth. So you just have to get together and decide, well, let's invent some words for these things. Then the kids will be able to talk about the things that they really like to talk about, the video games and the VCR and the cameras and the computers and everything else. And it will make the language just that much more attractive to them because it will be more useful. So get together with your elders and your fluent speakers, teachers and even students. Get people together and see what you can come up with. See if you can get some terms using some of these strategies, some terms that will catch on and that will really seem like they belong in your language so that at some point, a generation or two from now, People will be very surprised to hear the history and that someone actually invented that word. They'll think it's been in there all along. A good Comanche word, a good Caddo word, a good Pawnee word. Keep your languages living by keeping them modern. That's all for tonight. See you next time on WordPath. <laughs> Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gwana kita, wa pene ma na ole kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gwana kita, wa pene ma na ole kita.